What is happening, everyone? Coach Ishak with HawkFit Coaching and Legion Athletics and your host for today's episode of Anabolic Radio. I'm joined today by Will Wallace. He has a PhD in human performance and his discipline is neuroscience. He's real particular about brain optimization and things like nootropics. Um, we'll be diving into one of the most neglected areas of health, and that's proper sleep. And we'll also be diving into diving into topics like brain optimization. So something you'll definitely want to stick around for. Will, how are you today? Good, man. How you doing? Good, good, good. I know we had a little conversation before the episode started, but um, I we haven't particularly met, met in person, but I know you through Chris <clears throat> Barricat and... Um, He's someone you brush shoulders with down in Tampa, I believe, you said? Yep, yep. So right now I'm in Fort Lauderdale. Um, and like we were talking about, I, uh, I went to grad school with Chris. Um, and I had actually, uh, my tenure um, while I was getting my master's degree was ending um, while Chris's was beginning. So that's how we met. Um, now Chris is a good friend of mine. I'm in Tampa pretty often. Um, and, you know, I see him. Uh, probably every every couple of months I see him and we message I'd say pretty frequently. Um, also to, to preface, um, I'm not I do not have my PhD yet. I however I am in the middle of doing my dissertation, which is why it's 7 p.m. on the West Coast and I'm still sitting in my office. Um, so probably six more months of that and then and then I'll officially have that. Amen. You're in the final stretch of things, almost there. And thanks for taking the time to take the time out of your day to come on this podcast, have a discussion with us. And, you know, uh, ultimately, this conversation will be used for um, a lot of people in regards to improving their health. And I'm sure a lot of people will take a lot of value out of this. But um, let's go ahead and get started with this discussion. So in my in my opinion, one of the I'm sure you could agree with me, but one of the biggest issues um, when people start feeling like crap, they stop progressing, whether that be with their training or when th- in regards to things like fat loss. Everyone and their mom starts looking towards the most advanced methods to employ in hopes of better managing like their stagnation or their they plateaued, right? But yet they're not doing anything to optimize their sleep or manage it responsibly. Um, I think over the course of my coaching career, like I've stumbled across clients who have the most horrendous sleep hygiene I've seen. And people usually fall into two groups. You know, you have people who like to admit they do have an issue with sleep, whether that be like with falling asleep or staying asleep. And then you have people who, um, you know, they say they get good sleep, but when you dig a little bit deeper, you're only finding out that they're getting suboptimal six hours of sleep. And um, and they're relying on things like melatonin and magnesium. And I know um, nootropics and supplements are part of your wheelhouse, so maybe later in the episode we could ex- expand in in regards to um, things you could do to better manage your sleep. But um, why don't we go ahead and you know give give you the floor? Um, what do you think the biggest thing um, in regards to preventing people to get a uh, sufficient amount of sleep in every day? So I think yeah, I think it's interesting. To, to go back to what to what you first said, um, that people and this, I find this interesting, particularly when you look at people who are highly into um, fitness, particularly when you get into I want to kind of classify everybody as in the bodybuilding crowd. And <clears throat> what I find interesting, and this is just from observation, um, is that you know people tend to have. Um, uh, an all in or nothing type of mentality, you know, so the mentality is you push your body to the extreme because theoretically by doing so, uh, the recovery phase should have you eclipsing, uh, your previous baseline statistics, you know, whatever those may be (laughs) when it comes to sleep, that's one of the things that's most easily thrown away, right? Like you're up late, like, um, doing work, homework, Uh, Whatever the case may be, trying to get your meals in, I don't know, Um, you know, but you have a 5 a.m. alarm set to get to the gym. And because fitness is your passion, there's no way you're missing that 5 a.m. alarm, yet you might be going to bed at midnight or past. And the mentality is just push through it because that's what the mentally tough do. So, Mm. excuse me. So I do think that, uh, that, that it's an interesting dichotomy 
mm. particularly in the fitness industry when it does come to sleep. And I know that nowadays people are starting to understand the importance even more so. And <clears throat> we're, we're seeing a lot of different devices, uh, apps, and techniques people are using to track their sleep. It kind of goes into the, the question that you asked is, uh, you know, what kinds of things, or I guess, how are people, how can they better take advantage of sleep and how can they better set themselves up for good sleep? Mm. We see uh, a, a big rise in these tracking apps, you know, uh, you have Aura Ring, uh, which is a really popular one. And you have people are actually able to objectively um, look at their sleep statistics um, and then, you know, work on the variables outside of sleep that might influence their sleep either in a direct or indirect manner. Um, so if, and again, here's, here's an interesting, um, my interesting take on that is I think that those can be incredibly beneficial, particularly for people like the very fitness minded individuals, even though sleep's important for everybody mm. where sleep might be even more so important because now you have, um, a lot more physical or physiological healing that needs to take place while you are asleep. So there might be an increased demand for sleep in some cases. Um, <clears throat> what I find interesting about all these apps and tracking devices is now people are starting to get less sleep because they're worrying too much about getting more sleep. So it's a little bit of an interesting paradox where I, I know people who use those tracking apps and their sleep tends to get worse over time because now they're getting into bed knowing that they slept like shit the night before mm. and they're thinking in their head, oh man, like what if I can't sleep tonight? Uh, what, you know, what if I'm waking up in the middle of the night? Um, and even those tiny thoughts, uh, they do actually affect, they do actually affect your sleep, either sleep onset, your ability to fall asleep at a certain time when you get into bed and or the amount of times you wake up in the middle of the night. I know it's happening for myself. Um, if I get a poor night's sleep the night before, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and then the next night I find out that, oh, no, I'm rushing to get in bed at a certain time. I get in bed, I'm like, oh, no, what if I can't fall asleep tonight? Mm. And that thought actually eats at me and keeps me awake. Mm -hmm. Same thing. When I wake up in the middle of the night, maybe to use the restroom or something, I get back in bed and, oh, no, what if I can't fall back asleep and I slept like crap the night before or something like that? And those thoughts, everything kind of compounds. And it continues to affect your sleep. So finding the perfect balance isn't the easiest thing in the world. Um, it's not obvious to me that a lot of these tracking apps are helpful for a lot of people. But at the same time, I'm not going to say they're not because normally when you can measure something objectively and you have actual biofeedback, you know, there, there are appropriate steps you can take to better enhance something like sleep. Mm. I love what you said how, you know, in, well, I mean, it could be even said about today's, you know, modern society, how it's, you go scroll on social media, you see everyone saying grind, just fucking grind, just fucking grind, push through it, work harder. Um, and all, of, all of that is super important, right? And there, there are specific, like, I would say situations, specific times where you may need to sacrifice a little bit of sleep to get things done. But ultimately, in the big picture of things, you need to be obtaining a suf sufficient amount of sleep every day, especially like if your main goal is to build muscle to maximize things like um, lean body mass, to maximize processes like fat oxidation. And as much as we know how s essential sleep really is, there's a vast majority of us who don't really understand the complexities as to why we sleep or a lot of the underlying mechanisms that occur in the process and how that impacts us physiologically. Um, lack of it, I mean, it has adverse effects on endocrine function in regards to becoming a little bit more insulin resistant, which just means you can't use carbohydrates as efficiently. And um, it has metabolic and um, inflammatory processes, and it could lead to neurobehavioral deficits, whether that be like brain fog or lack of attention, like reduced cognitive output, depressed moods, um, or increased rate of sympathetic dominance, right? Because ever, as soon as we wake up, we're on the go, go, go. Most of us every single day, we don't really stop to take a deep breath, really try to promote that parasympathetic state. Um, so Will, why don't you go ahead and take the floor? Why don't we expand off into um, the different mechanisms and stages of sleep? Okay, so yeah, I think now depending on who you talk to, there's four or five different stages of sleep. 
I know that some people take um, stage, if you're using four stages, they'll take stage three being um, non-REM, but deep sleep or slow wave sleep. And they'll take that and they'll split it up into two stages. But for our purposes, we'll just use four. <coughs> so we have three stages of non-REM, non-REM one, non-REM two. Um, and then we have stage three, which we also call deep sleep, which is characterized by a lot of slow wave brain activity in the form of delta waves. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm just prefacing for everybody that you know, I have. I'm getting over um, a pulmonary infection. So i periodically coughing throughout this whole thing. Um, but anyways, uh, and then after deep sleep, then we tend to enter REM sleep, which uh, is rapid eye movement sleep. Um, that, that stage of sleep is characterized by brain activity that is more similar to brain activity that happens while we're in a more wakeful state. However, our muscles are completely completely immobilized. Um, this is the state we dream in. And if our muscles weren't immobilized, this is the state where uh, we would be acting out our dreams uh, if that wasn't the case. So for most of us, for most of us, that's no good because we'd probably end up in jail. But <laughs> so those are the three different stages of sleep. Or sorry, the four different stages of sleep. Um, and what happens is we tend to cycle through those stages um, between four and five times a night. Um, and going through an entire cycle, it, it normally lasts anywhere from, it takes about 90 um, to 110 minutes for mm -hmm. us to go through a cycle. And then typically when you wake up in the middle of the night, you'll have just ended one of those cycles coming out of REM sleep. Uh, normally REM is happening just before, just before we wake up. Mm -hmm. So those are the, th the four different stages of sleep. Um, <clears throat> every single one of those has some kind of biological importance, though a lot of it is still really a mystery. However, it is kind of stages three and four being deep sleep uh, and REM sleep, where we see if those stages particularly are interrupted um, in chronic fashion. And I mean both of them because you have models where, um, you know, so that people taking SSRIs um, chronically uh, they're raising neural levels of serotonin. And when you enter REM sleep, there are parts of the brain where serotonin dips and acetylcholine goes up. Um, and it's probably, <coughs> excuse me, it's probably the, those acetylcholine concentrations which help to act on certain um, visual processing that allow us to dream um, in different ways. So people who are taking SSRIs, they tend to get much less REM sleep and or they don't enter REM. However, there's an interesting physiological phenomena where they also don't tend to suffer a whole lot of memory decrements or they don't really suffer in memory performance. So <clears throat> that's suggesting that the brain does compensate in some ways. However, if you decrease REM sleep and you also decrease deep sleep, um, you're going to see a host of negative side effects uh, and negative outcomes pretty quickly. It only takes a couple of days, but kind of like you were referring to um, just a couple minutes ago, and especially if we're you know, going to talk about things as it pertains to the fitness-minded, um, just a couple of days of sleep deprivation in terms of tapering sleep back, but also only one day of sleep deprivation uh, in the form of an entire night sleep loss. So let's say you pull a 24 hour, um, studying, um, you know, or, and, or insomnia for whatever reasons, <clears throat> really recent research does show that in healthy men, um, when one night of sleep is lost, completely lost, uh, that is a, a 24 hour, uh, wakefulness period, there are increased markers of muscle cat catabolism. Uh, there's also increased markers suggesting that there's an increase in adipogenesis and lipogenesis. So now rather than using stem cells uh, to donate nuclei to damaged tissue and or to you know, differentiate into myocytes um, to actually repair and build new muscle, you're using stem cells to actually convert into fat cells and store more fat. So from a body composition standpoint, I can definitely wreak havoc on you. 
And even if you're not staying up all night, but you are just tapering sleep down in terms of hours, after a couple of days, insulin sensitivity um, can go down anywhere from 13 to 30 percent, really depending on what your health is like and the degree to which the sleep deprivation takes place. Mm. Mm, that has serious implications for those who are contest prepping or physique athletes. Um, and, you know, it's funny because when I was getting in the deeper final stages of prep, um, you know, sleep disruption was something that was ha- occurring like at least two to three times a week. Like I would either have really shitty sleep quality or the quantity was whack, like four or five hours. It was ridiculous. But um, I guess that's just um, my body letting me know that it's super uncomfortable being in that state for long periods of time. But um, yeah, man, great points. Awesome points. And um, I've, I've, I love this idea about sleep pressure and how, you know, really understanding all the processes that occur in the body, there's eventually like an accumulation of different chemicals in the brain, one of which being adenosine. And um, <laughs> just because like the brain is the biggest glycogen consumer in the body, right? And obviously, there are other chemicals that play a role into not only inducing sleep, but getting us to stay asleep. Do we want to break off into there and how that has um, or the processes in which that occurs? Sure. So, <coughs> excuse me. So you just alluded to one of them, um, but there's two primary processes that kind of govern and regulate the amount of sleep that we need and get. Um, One of them uh, is the most commonly known one being the 24-hour circadian rhythm. Um, And the other one, like you alluded to, is called uh, sleep pressure. And that's that's really defined as a a process that dictates the amount and the depth of sleep that we need based on a period of prior wakefulness. So we'll just use today as um, an example. You know, it's 7.30 uh, p.m. East Coast, my time. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, I've had a really long day. I've had a, um, uh, a lot, of, a lot of, <coughs> of work to get done, A, for uh, my employers, but B, for school as well. Um, and now we're doing this. So over the course of an entire day, um, you know, my day has probably been more cognitively demanding than it has been I would say yesterday or the day before that. Now, sleep pressure, what happens is it tends to build the longer that we're awake. Um, But also, it tends to build more strongly as we stress ourselves um, cognitively or in some kind of cognitive capacity. A lot of the research shows that um, just by increasing physical activity, we don't necessarily increase sleep pressure. Now, I'd have to preface that by saying that the research there, um, it's not incredibly robust when you look at physical versus cognitive activity, right? Mm. Like a lot of the models are done in animals. And <coughs> excuse me. And one of the major ones that I'm referring to is um, in zebrafish, which I know people like laugh at that and they go, oh, how can you, you know, re- you know relate that to a human? And it's like, well, you know. Uh, research does have to be done in animals before it's done in humans and a zebrafish is a really really good model that's widely used and has been for a long time for actually assessing um, the function of neurons so uh, basically I know that in this particular study there were stimulants given that increased cognitive activity and stimulants given that didn't increase cognitive activity activity but did increase physical activity um, and that would be likened to more just a lot more movement in the day um, in terms of you could liken it to more endurance type exercise where there's not really a whole lot of like, uh, say, like muscle damage or breakdown and probably not causing as high a degree of protein turnover as something like resistance training. Mm-hmm. Right. So it would be interesting to see what this looked like if interest, if uh, resistance training uh, was added to this model. But anyways, <clears throat> The stimulants that increase cognitive activity, um, they rose. <coughs> God damn, has that problem? Uh, they rose the expression of a protein called galanin in neurons, um, and the higher the expression of this protein, 
the deeper the sleep and the longer the sleep that those animals got in the subsequent night. But the animals that just increased their physical activity and did increase it to a rather large degree had no change in their sleep activity from night to night. The interesting thing was uh, in the animals that got them more sleep uh, due to the increased glanin content in the neurons, glanin returned to baseline levels the day after um, when they had you know, theoretically achieved the level of sleep they needed to return to homeostasis. Uh, and then the following night, their sleep normalized. So sleep pressure um, is primarily dictated by how long we are awake, but also dictated by the type of cognitive output that we have over the course of an entire day to bring our bodies back to some level of homeostasis. So what I tell people is, you know, and <clears throat> excuse me, and this is this is really relevant for people who have seizures, because think of the amount, you know, the increased neural activity that's happening when people have seizures. And or if you do a lot of knowledge work um, and you have a really long day at work where you're really cognitively taxed or you're a student and you're going through finals, it's particularly important to make sure that not only you're doing everything you can to get the best quality sleep as possible, but you do want to even allow yourself for a larger time window, you know, just in case anything goes wrong, but also a larger time window to get as much sleep as possible during those periods so that your health um, isn't impacted negatively. Mm. Great points, great points. Now, when it comes to sleeping stra or th strategies that just generally improve sleep, I always like telling my clients to focus on quality, quantity, and consistency. And it's always going to be variable. It's always going to be a variable target based on the individual, right? But ideally, we want to be sleeping for as long as we need. And which is like, that's ultimately going to be something that's like sleeping without an alarm clock, for example. It's not feasible long term for most people, but being able to do that for a day or two, you really see how you'll feel in regards to just like general feeling, maybe performance, maybe you recover better. And um, it also takes looking at things like we're doing nutritionally or light exposure, utilizing things like blue light blockers um, and um, Overtraining could be also something that impacts your sleep. So these are all things, all different variables to take into account when it comes to trying to improve sleep quantity and quality. Uh, Will, what are some tips that you have in regards to just improving sleep all around? And maybe we could expand off into blue light blockers and how that disrupts um, or how blue light can disrupt our natural sleep wake cycle. Okay, so yeah, it's a, it's a, that's an interesting one, especially because um, the original research looking at blue light um, and how it affects uh, melatonin secretion, you know, blue light stimulates uh, melanopsin is a protein in the eyes, um, and it senses a low frequency light, like blue light. So low frequency, um, and, or sorry, high frequency, uh, low wave. So low wave, high frequency. Um, anyway, so it senses that kind of light and it suppresses uh, melatonin. Now, that was the initial research showed that. And so people theorize, okay, well, blue light is on that end of the spectrum. It's very high frequency. It's very low wave. Um, so blue light, you know, must be the strongest blocker of melatonin, uh, melatonin um, <coughs> which as people know, that's what we secrete at night. Uh, when we're ready to go to bed, and that's part of our 24-hour circadian rhythm process that gets us ready for sleep. So a lot of us know and have heard that exposing ourselves to blue light at night may push that time window back at which our bodies actually start to secrete melatonin, and it certainly does. Uh, what's interesting is that the notion that blue light is the strongest regulator of our 24-hour clocks in terms of light exposure uh, has been challenged recently. And actually, very recently, I think in maybe December of 2019, so just two months ago. Wow, that was, there was super recent. Yeah, <laughs> so there was a study published um, in rats. And what they did was they kept light intensities the same, 
they expose one of them to blue light, which again, so blue light's on one end of the spectrum, I think short wave, high frequency. And then you have, as you start to creep over towards the middle of the light spectrum, you have yellow, which the wavelength gets a little bit longer, the frequency is a little bit less, but then you have like orange and red, where red is like the longest wavelength and the shortest frequency. So, <coughs> excuse me, what's interesting was that study showed that uh, melanopsin receptors, that basically what they do is, or the melanopsin protein, uh, they basically sense the light uh, and then they signal the retino hypothalamic tract, which you know tells the suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's a part uh, of the it's a part of the uh, Such a great so, name, suprachiasmatic nucleus. <laughs> Close. <coughs> suprachiasmatic nucleus. It um it's part of the hypothalamus, and it's basically the body's pacemaker. So. Uh, think of every just about it's been theorized that every cell in our body has a 24 hour clock or a circadian rhythm clock um and the this part of the hypothalamus basically regulates uh the time at which all of those clocks are set to so when we get light exposure in the morning um this part of the brain basically starts to communicate with the rest of the body letting them know what time it is and what functions they should be performing, yada, yada, yada. So these researchers are showing now that not only is it the melanopsin proteins and those receptors in the eye, but the retinal cone actually senses our perception of color. And this might also play a role in light exposure and our our circadian rhythms. So the researchers took blue light, <coughs> excuse me, and they took yellow light because yellow light is a bit more indicative of kind of twilight and daytime colors. What they found was that the yellow light, and in theory, the yellow light shouldn't have had as big of an impact on circadian rhythms, blue light, but the retinal cone sensed the yellow light as though it were daytime and the yellow light had a stronger effect on pushing the circadian rhythm back a little bit and suppressing melatonin secretion than did the blue light. And both lights were of equal intensity. So now the theory is, okay, it's not just the color of light. Um, and it's also not just the intensity of light because think about it, um, the intensity of light or the brightness of light is not a good indicator of what time of the day it is. Mm. You know, if it's raining outside, and it's very cloudy all day. Well, it's much darker than a day where it's 90 degrees and sunny in Florida. So our bodies need to have another way of taking in light exposure and being able to tell what time it is. So <clears throat> now the theory is that, OK, it's both intensity and color that may play a major role. And I think what's interesting about blue light blockers and even, you know, we have apps on our phones and on our computers that when a certain time hits, the light dims a little bit and the color shifts. Well, I think now what we're seeing with this new research is that a lot of, a lot of these um, blue light blockers, they'll dim the light, but they do so while changing the color to a more yellowish, light, orangish, orangish color. And... The color itself, so we may be sacrificing brightness for color, um, and that may not still not be doing the trick in terms of but blocking. Up. Go ahead. Sorry to cut you off. Is that color, in regards to like the orange or yellowish, something that can be potentially impacting sleep? So, like a bunch of people are buying blue light blockers, but they could be shooting themselves in the foot. So I think what now there's still it's tough because there still needs to be like a lot of research in this area. It's really not as fleshed out as people think it is. Mm. But now imagine what researchers, yeah, what researchers start to say is basically try to use colors that are a bit more cool and dim uh, and also keep the brightness down. So now we need to be aware of the colors we're using, but also the brightness we're using them at, because if I'm taking a yellow color, and just turning the brightness down, that might be pushing 
my circadian response back even further than blue light um, of an equal intensity, you know, but, uh, you know, if I'm taking one that say, let's look at longer wavelengths like red light or orange light. Um, now those ones may not be as harsh, especially if we keep them dim. So red light at um, a really bright or a high intensity has actually shown to also push back the circadian response to sleep, though it doesn't it doesn't inhibit melatonin secretion altogether. It mm -hmm. will push it back just a little bit. So we need to be cautious about the colors we're exposing ourselves to in terms of light and the brightness and the brightness that we are. So it gets complicated. And, and this is where I'm talking about where I said in the beginning, possibly too much feedback, right? Sometimes too, <laughs> too much information is a bad thing because now we have people that are going to be obsessing about the types of light they're exposed to and the brightness and they're going to be checking their apps. And it's like, mm. are you now stressing yourself out more so than you need to, mm. to actually Sleep get... should be easy. Right. Yeah. Like think about like back in, you know, back in the good old days, like people went to sleep when it got dark outside and they woke up when it was light mm -hmm. and nobody had an issue, you know? Yeah, um, we all, uh, we, we usually, we rise with the sun, we go down with the sun, but um, us being humans and like technologically advanced, we have um, sort of shot ourselves in the foot with all the lights and, you know, it's a lot of sleep hygiene too, right? So like, obviously, if you're in your house at night with all your lights on super bright, like it's warm, you're not in a calm environment, you have music blasting, obviously, these are going to be things that are stimulating you and they're going to inhibit you from getting in a more um, relaxed state in that quote unquote parasympathetic dominant state. Um, so that's interesting that you say that. Now, I know this is kind of going in the back in the deep end again, but um, is it have, did you see that if the yellow light uh, impacts melatonin secretions? So they in that particular study, they didn't look at melatonin secretion, <coughs> excuse me, mm. because it's really only an indirect marker. Um, it's really only an indirect marker of how, you know, your 24-hour circadian rhythm is functioning. And it's really only taking into account the melanopsin proteins and what they're sensing and kind of disregarding the retinal cone um, and the actual colors that it takes in and actually, you know, you know perceives a, a certain a certain point of the day based off of, you know, say something like uh, yellow light. Mm -hmm. So no, they didn't. They didn't look at melatonin secretion in that particular study. Um, but like I said, I do know that lights with longer wavelengths and lower frequencies, like the red light, especially if dimmer, uh, those tend to have the smallest, uh, the smallest impact, to our knowledge, on um, say like pushing back the secretion of melatonin at night. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, and it's um I've been seeing a lot of this red light therapy around lately. Are you familiar with any of that? I'm familiar, yeah. Did you want to sort of expand off in it just <laughs> for curiosity? Yeah, yeah. So I mean I'll just I'll do like a quick like you know, and I'm not like I wouldn't consider myself an expert here, but um I know enough about what's out there. So <clears throat> excuse me. You know, so I know that like people that sell red lights, they claim that red light therapy, you know, equates to better sleep. And uh, I was actually reading this just the other day. I'm not going to name the company, but in their blog, they were like citing research about how red light therapy, the a group of people that got red light therapy had more melatonin secretion at night comparatively to people that were exposed to blue light. And then you go look at the study and you're like, okay, but their melatonin was no different than the control group. So this is only making a case against blue light at night. It's not making a case for red light. Red light. Yeah. So <clears throat> now I know that there is research. So the research on red light therapy for like helping sleep is like poor. It's not really very existent. However, it, it does actually have research. Um, and it has a reasonable amount of animal research showing that um, it can be beneficial for skin health, mm. uh, muscle health, 
um, as well as reducing inflammation in certain states. There's even there's an, there's actually animal research showing that it could be effective for people with TBI. So, <clears throat> and that might That's have something to do that might have something to do with the, the anti-inflammatory effects. And if people are getting better sleep because of it, I would theorize that it might be because of any anti-inflammatory effects that they were getting. I, I know that there's a lot of like, um, <coughs> excuse me, you were talking about it um, before we started, all the misinformation on Instagram. Um, and I see a lot of, uh, a lot of high profile um, influencers, you know, they promote the red light and they're like, man, like, yeah, I use this for seasonal affective disorder, you know, like the sad disorder. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, let's back that up for a second because there's no evidence that there's no evidence that it really helps. Um, it really helps any of that actually. Um, <clears throat> um, those types of things are actually more closely linked to, uh, again, like different types, like circadian rhythms. But when it comes to red light, I were to think that if anybody had depression or a bipolar disorder, that was a consequence of a chronic inflammatory state. And if red light therapy had some kind of effect in lowering inflammation in their case, then okay, maybe it does help with mood disorders. However, that's a stretch. Um, I'm not saying it's not possible. Like, I think it's definitely possible, but in terms of research, research there needs to be more research. There needs to be there needs to be actual research put into that. Now, there's more evidence that using blue light is effective for something like seasonal affective disorders and social anxiety disorders, um, and even helping people with TBI uh, recover a little mm. bit more quickly in terms of cognitive function. <clears throat> and again, that has more to do with um, a theory behind circadian rhythms um, and how people that aren't getting like enough light exposure and or they aren't exposed to enough Zeitgebers, um, how those things might be affecting. Zeitgebers, the, uh, that's another yeah. great word. First, <laughs> we have super charismatic nucleus, now this one. <laughs> you know, it talks about, so basically research does suggest that, um, you know, depression or, or anxiety uh, it, it can be because of a lack of stimuli that activates certain areas of the brain that do help to regulate circadian rhythm. And because of that, you see an altered functional connectivity between brain regions where certain brain regions aren't really speaking to one another that should be. Um, and that was now there's research in a TBI model that just got published maybe three months ago showing that blue light in the morning helped to increase functional connectivity of brain areas involved in alertness and wakefulness um, mm -hmm. because people with TBIs, one of the symptoms is depression. You know, they do have mood disorders following it a lot of the time. Um, <clears throat> and that can be due to inflammation. Uh, it can be due to nutritional deficiencies that happen as a consequence. Um, but what we do know is that there is decreased uh, functional connectivity in regions of the brain um, that manage alertness and those increase when there is consistent exposure to blue light upon waking. Mm, great points, man. Great points. And um, sleep is so fundamental. It's like literally one of the most underrated things you could do in regards to just stress management, in regards to better optimizing your general health, in regards to just improving your training performance recovery. And for those of you listening to this podcast, you know I always scream and shout that optimizing general health is first and foremost your best bet before even trying to pursue like a body composition related goal, before even inducing a calorie deficit. You got to ensure that you're functioning properly, you're sleeping properly. Like all these things are foundations of health outside of you pursuing your body composition related goals. And there's a lot of negative impacts in regards to disordered sleep or disrupted sleep. Um, Will, did you want to expand off into here on some of the implications for uh, disordered sleep and um, how it could impact us physiologically? Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> first, I think 
let's just say so again like obviously i think everybody listening to this would agree that sleep is one of your body's most important biological functions in fact it's so important that whatever functions it seems to serve um it's necessary that there needs to be some type of sensory disconnect so think about it uh when we go to sleep our bodies are at our most vulnerable now if sensory disconnect so completely disconnecting the senses and be, being in a vulnerable state if that wasn't necessary for these functions to take place we would have evolved over time to take care of those functions while we were awake because it's, it's not very adaptive to be vulnerable um you know to anything um for an eight hour stretch of time that's a pretty long time to not really mm -hmm. be aware of what's happening around you so sleep is that important um but <clears throat> in terms of physiological impacts and let's just talk body composition um you know there was a, a study i think it was in 2016 i think it was 2016 um now these people were obese but they were put on a pretty a pretty reasonable calorie deficit and then their sleep there was one group where their sleep was restricted and i can't remember how many days it was but it wasn't very long it was only a couple of days if i recall correctly um one group was told to sleep 5.5 hours a night and the other group slept a, a normal eight hours a night and at the end of a couple of days <coughs> excuse me or maybe it was a week either way yeah, i believe it was a week to nine days actually um at the end of the study what they showed was that the group that slept the five hours and they were all on um the same <coughs> excuse me the same calorie deficit the group that only slept five hours actually saw a 50%, there was a 50% 50 difference in fat mass in that the group that slept more, I think they lost 1.4 kilograms, so a little more than, what are we talking about, close to three pounds? Of lean tissue. Yeah, close to close to three pounds. They, so they, they lost close to three pounds of fat mass, whereas the group that lost that only slept five hours they lost like a pound and a half if that of fat mass so they only lost 50 percent of the fat mass that the group who slept twice what they did was um there was also actually a decrease a significant decrease i can't remember the percent i want to say it was around 30 don't quote me um in fat free mass so be that water bone muscle tissue you know whatever um, so only a couple of like I said, and I think that was just a week. So after a week's time, you're losing out on 50%, um, of potential fat loss by pushing yourself harder than you need to. That's a lot. Sleep. Yeah. So, you know, so there's a, there's a, the, the classic trope that sleep is for the weak. Um, you know, I think that that should shift a bit more into the, the weak don't sleep. Hmm. Hmm. Great points. And um, I guess this could go into appetite regulation, too, and how it impacts leptin, ghrelin, and um, how there's dysfunction in regards to your hunger and satiety when it comes to lack of sleep, right? Hormonally, metabolically, ghrelin is commonly known as the hunger hormone. It <coughs> stimulates things like gastric juices, growth hormone, and hunger. And if you're constantly sleep-deprived, you're increasing the recipe for hunger later in the day when you wake up. And we, we know that leptin, you know, it's secreted by fat cells, regulates appetite, allows us to feel more satiated. It tells our body to become more active, move more, increase neat. Like if you are sleeping, you're also going to have implications in regards to that as well. And um, so crazy how just sleeping... Phew, impacts fat loss to such a great extent and um, I know you're super familiar with nootropics and supplements and um, I I was curious in regards to like some of the under expanding on into some of the underlying mechanisms of how caffeine works and how in understanding that we could see how it prevents or allows us to be more alert throughout the day okay so do you want me to go into caffeine sure okay so <clears throat> caffeine is interesting um, because 
a lot of us widely, I mean, we vary so widely in how we metabolize it. Um, though you can take everybody and kind of put them in a window where the half-life of caffeine is really anywhere from two and a half to six hours, um, depending on who you are and how you're expressing certain enzymes. You know, also it's important to be aware that um, people who are smokers um, or take nicotine regularly, the half-life of caffeine is going to be basically cut down by 50%. Um, oh, wow. Taking wow, I didn't know that. So, <clears throat> yep, so same enzymes that break that down, um, upregulate to break down nicotine. Um, and also, if you're a female and you're on um, contraceptives, then uh, the half-life of caffeine is probably going to increase by about 50%. So it's important to know these things when you're trying to figure out what is an optimal dose of caffeine for you and what is an optimal dose throughout the course of the day. I think it's important to know how much caffeine you take in regularly. Um, you know, if you already have, you know, if say if you're a female and that half-life is extended out by 50% because of oral contraceptives, well, now, what if you have, you know, your whatever, I don't know, your pre-workout in the morning, um, and then do you drink an energy drink or a coffee at noon, which can't be much farther from when you went to the gym in the morning, but caffeine is probably still built up in your system, and now you're just raising plasma levels even higher. So <clears throat> it's important to know the type of buildup that you're causing because the end consequence is going to be that that affects your tolerance at mm. some point, right? And we all know that caffeine has uh, several incredib incredible health benefits. And actually, caffeine consumption um, is increased with reduced risk for all-cause mortality. Um, but past a certain point, then you're going to start to have more negative side effects than you will positive ones. <clears throat> and what caffeine does essentially is it mimics a stress response um, in the body. Now, I know stress is like a scary word, but stress is a very adaptive thing, right? If we didn't release cortisol as well as like epinephrine, norepinephrine, and increased dopamine levels, then we wouldn't actually be able to adapt, um, at least adapt optimally to a lot of situations that we're thrown into. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, when you're chronically ingesting high doses of caffeine, well, not only are you depleting catecholamines, you know, like dopamine, like norepinephrine, and these things that help your brain to actually function at a higher rate when you are stressed and when you do need it, but now you're taking cortisol and you're elevating it chronically, um, and a lot of us know the implications of that. That's one of the reasons why... Uh, we think that sleep deprivation results in increased markers of muscle catabolism is because of an increased cortisol response. Mm. Outside of that, you could be less sensitive to a cortisol response in other situations, which we just said that's not good for adaptive, <coughs> excuse me, that's not good for adaptive purposes. Mm -hmm. Great points, man. Great points. Everybody loves caffeine, but I think um, it gets mismanaged in its use. And um, a lot of people who tend to have disrupted sleep or disordered sleep, um, they don't realize how much caffeine they're consuming throughout a duration of the day. Or they're consuming like things that are heavily caffeinated past 4 p.m., right? And then they figure they they're wondering why they have sleep problems. Uh, maybe because you just drank uh, mocha frappuccino whipped cream uh, from Starbucks. But great points, man. Um, and I'm also curious. I'm also curious about um, another supplement you may potentially be familiar with, and that's alpha GPC. Okay, so alpha GPC is um, alpha glycerophosphocholine, um, and that is. Well, it's a choline precursor, essentially. It's about 40% choline by weight, um, and choline is considered an essential nutrient. Um, our body does produce it a little bit, but it doesn't produce enough to maintain basal biological function. So alpha-GPC is 40% choline by weight, and choline is important for 
a bunch of different things. Um, one of the big things is it provides the structure for lipid membranes in the brain. A lot of your brain is actually made up from choline. Uh, choline can be broken down to form uh, signaling molecules. I think most of us have heard of acetylcholine, which our muscles use to contract. Our brain uses to send signals, and it's highly implicated um, in actual memory um, memory and recall tests. But alpha-GPC, <coughs> excuse me, does supply choline as well as a glycerophosphate group. Um, so choline with a prodrug. And um, there's different forms of supplemental choline out there. <coughs> Excuse me. Alpha GPC is probably the best supplemental form. If you're just trying to get choline, it's probably the best supplemental form outside of actually getting phospholipids um, from things like animal products, like eggs, meats, um, especially red meats and organ meats and things of that nature. But alpha GPC is actually shown to be very highly bioavailable as opposed to something like uh, choline bitartrate, which you'll see in a lot of pre-workout supplements. <coughs> um, choline bitartrate uh, is not highly bioavailable. It's basically choline attached to a salt, salt molecule. Um, and that doesn't have near the bioavailability as a uh, uh, a choline bound to a phospholipid like you'd find in like an egg mm. and or alpha GPC and whatever you you are getting from um, something like choline bitartrate, you're probably increasing if you are taking any up in plasma, which you are taking a little, you're probably increasing peripheral stores, but you're not doing a whole lot for uh, neural concentrations, which is where alpha GPC is kind of known for, but there is a little bit of research. Um, as far as like resistance training, like power output, um, mm. uh, increases in growth hormone and stuff. Oh, like wow. That. Really? Yeah. yeah. So there's a, <coughs> excuse me, there was an acute study done, uh, in males, I believe who took a, I think it was a gram of alpha GPC. Uh, and people need to be cautious too, because a lot of alpha GPCs on the market, even if the bottle doesn't say it, um, it might be 50% purity. So if you have a gram, you might only be getting, um, you know, 500 milligrams of actual alpha GPC. Um, but you can find pure alpha GPC. But anyways, they were supplementing with a gram um, and they saw acute increases in growth hormone. Now, is that worth anything? Uh, maybe. You know, who knows? Who knows? It was it was an acute dose. <coughs> and, <coughs> excuse me. And then I think the other study, because I know that I think there's only two of them to date, um, was using 1,200 milligrams, so 1.2 grams, um, and showing increased power output um, in terms of lower body power output, I believe, but I don't think there was any increases in upper body strength or power output. So it can be used as a cognitive enhancer um, as well as a physical performance enhancer, depending on what you're dosing it at um, and what you're using it for. But yeah, alpha-GPC is probably one of my top three favorite nootropics. And again, primarily to support overall brain health, but as well as providing uh, additional acetylcholine, you know, if your brain has to be a bit more active during the day. Mm. Great points, man. Great points. I definitely learned something new. I didn't know, um, even though it was an acute study, I guess it's, it's important to take away, right? Um, the thing about research is it shouldn't really like be there as hard set guidelines. Rather, it should be there like for us to, analyze it, you know, reflect on the data and understand how to potentially imp integrate it if there were um, useful outcomes and whatever um, they were trying to um, pull out of the study. But um, final one, number three, your favorite nootropic or supplement that helps optimization of brain health, what would you say that'd be? Oh, God. <coughs> That's a loaded question. I think um, <laughs> it's just everybody's everybody, <coughs> excuse me, and their needs are so different um, that this answer would it would definitely shift from person to person. Um, for sure. But I know for me, <coughs> excuse me, for myself, the problem isn't trying to like increase my IQ. Um, not to say that I have an incredibly high IQ, but. I don't know that there's any supplement on the planet that in can increase anybody's IQ. Um, so for me, it's more important to 
prolong continuous cognitive processing um, mm-hmm. to be able to just try to get more done in a day and so that I don't fatigue. Think about think about it like, uh, you know, I mean, hell, just exercising, right? If you're a big, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're a big promoter of achieving the highest volume that you can achieve and that resulting in like the biggest adaptive stimulus, then in theory, what you would want to do is prolong the onset of fatigue mm. um, so you can rack up volume, um, you know, and granted, that's not my take on physical training, but in terms of cognitive training, um, I don't think anybody has seen any limit to uh, the degrees to which you can push yourself cognitively. Um, I think, I mean, on a realistic level <laughs> in, ter- in terms of uh, stressing the brain in, in positive ways, not from like depriving it of anything. Um, so I think trying to just being able to um, continue my work and continue to process things without uh, fatiguing. And so that's what I need. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so in order to do that, um, a couple of things I find, find pretty beneficial are um, um, pine bark. Right, which doesn't seem like a big one, but uh, man, Pine Bark has so much damn data. Really? Um, Oh yeah, it's like it's almost like one of those things. Like you just see data keep popping up in all kinds of areas, and you're like, you know, I mean, it's made out to be like a a freaking miracle drug, which I don't buy. But it just like it just seems to help with everything. When you look at the research, you're like, oh, Pine Bark helps that too. Um, (laughs) So it's highly researched, specifically French maritime pine bark. The problem is, is there's so many patents surrounding it um, that it's such a it's such an expensive ingredient. Mm. Um, but it has really good data in people with ADHD. Um, I think a lot of the beneficial effects come from its ability to reduce inflammation. Um, but there's also there's also data with something like pine bark, which it, its primary active constituents are. Um, procyanidins or proanthocyanidins um and i think that they work similar to like polyphenol content Mm. when when they're shown to get into the brain uh you tend to be able to you tend to be able to have a higher cognitive capacity in that you can do more work um without fatiguing and i think i had posted something like that on my instagram a couple days ago but that was in regards to blueberry and grapeseed extract Mm -hmm. um you know but but i think that the same kind of theory runs true for for the the pine bark extract as well um but that that's one of like my top i would say that's probably one of my top three um natural herbals um Mm -hmm. of all time Mm -hmm. sounds like um it's good for everything sounds like ashwagandha to me (laughs) i really ashwagandha is probably my favorite supplement when it comes to just like (laughs) general stress general stress management um there's tons of research on it it's like ksm 66 they have a patent on it right yeah there's ksm 66 and also sensoril um the only difference between the two of them is really that ksm 66 is standardized to five percent with analydes which are the the theorized active um and the sensoril ashwagandha is standardized to 10 percent with analydes and then you know people try to make claims that there are big differences, but I really I really don't think that that's the case. I just think it, you know, it's a matter of how much biologically active substance you're getting. Um, mm. But I think you're right. You know, I <coughs> I laugh because people talk about ashwagandha all the time. They talk about how they you know they add in the class of adaptogens, and I have my own thought on adaptogens. But I, I do like ashwagandha uh, primarily for Primarily for its cortisol reducing effects, but yeah, I like ashwagandha. Mm, what are your thoughts on adaptogens? <laughs> are we gonna go down oh. that rabbit hole? Are you short on time? I know you said you're short on time. Are no, we for, we're, uh, okay? All right. No, I've, I'm just genuinely curious to hear your thoughts on adaptogens. So I think it's just like the idea behind adaptogens is it just sounds like fairy dust. So. Uh, the definition of an adaptogen is really just like a substance that helps return your body to homeostasis, you know, um, in regards to several different stressors. It's very vague. Mm. It's very broad. 
it makes it seem like, oh, like you stubbed your toe taking adaptogen. Um, <laughs> right? It sounds it sounds like magic. Um, <clears throat> there's nothing. I, I can't think of any substance on the planet that you can use for almost any stressor that's put on the body. Now, I think that a lot of things that I think that what we do is we take things that have uh, a lot of different biological effects, um, allegedly, and we just kind of shoehorn them under the you know the umbrella of must be an adaptogen. Whereas all of these you know extracts or vitamins or whatever, like they, they all you know a lot of them do have some kind of biological effect. Mm. I mean, like assuming the days are something like ashwagandha, like ashwagandha certainly has biological effects. Like there's a lot of research on it. Um, but you know, I think that most of its beneficial effects come from its ability to reduce something like cortisol. You know, I'm just throwing that. That's a big one, right? It probably does some other things as well, but you know, I mean, there's data showing that it interacts with the GABA, the GABA receptor, in some kind of way, though we're not really sure how that is, and that might be how it promotes better sleep. Mm-hmm. But again, it might promote better sleep because it reduces cortisol. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a study showing that it helps raise testosterone. Um, I think the men were hy- no, I don't think the men were hypogonadal in that study, but um, that's a likely consequence of its ability to reduce cortisol. You know, so it's like it, it might have a lot of different effects. Based as a result of as a result of a couple primary effects, you know, Mm -hmm. and so because of that, I just think ashwagandha. It it just sounds like too much snake oil, or sorry, not ashwagandha. Sorry, adaptogens. Um, it just sounds like um, snake oil, you know. Mm -hmm. So some of these big adaptogens, like yes, they are helpful for some things, but not all things. So, but I I don't think the idea is harmful. It's not the end all, be all. There has to be other like stress management techniques in place. Yeah, like it's more of like an annoying concept to me, but it's not mm-hmm. it's not harmful because nobody's going to hurt themselves taking ashwagandha. Mm-hmm. Great points, man. Great points, and um, I definitely think we had a great discussion in regards to sleep. Are there any key tips you would like to leave the audience with in regards to just? general brain optimization or just improving their quality of sleep? Yeah, I think that something that I have found benefit in, and it's interesting because I've actually, I've actually gone back and looked at other people who I admire throughout history, like Carl Jung, Sigmund Freud. um, And I've looked at a lot of their routines throughout the course of the day. And (coughs) excuse me. And from a, a neurological perspective, it, it seems very beneficial to take frequent time off in that, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a lot to get done and it would be very easy for me to continue working once we get off this call. Um, and I have the motivation to do it. Um, and I also have the discipline to do it at the same time. I know that doing that and hey, that might impact my sleep, but even if not, I'm still consuming a lot of resources um, that need to be resupplied when I sleep. And if I'm not cautious about that today and treat this whole week like a marathon, that will affect my work performance tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to know when to shut off. And you had alluded to that a couple times talking about how um, we're kind of, uh, you know, we're kind of overstimulated, not really focusing on our parasympathetic drive enough or trying to optimize that. So I think... Uh, choosing a time of the day. And it also helps you to be efficient with your work in a day. Choose a time of the day where your day is relatively mapped out and go at this time of the day, I'm done. So then, you know, I need to get everything I get done, like need to get done at this time. And now, you know, it it hits 830. I can tell my brain the day is over, unwind, close my computer. um, And whatever work I have to do, I'm not going to let, it doesn't stress me out because I know that I'm not allowed to touch it tonight. Mm. And that, that sets me up to now be more refreshed for tomorrow. I know that sounds like very small, um, but over time it has a very accumulative effect. For sure. Great tips, great tips, great points. I, I find that that definitely helps me a lot too, because, you know, being running my own business, like there's always something that has to be done. There's always projects that have to be worked on and you know, really making that distinction between, you know, work time and, okay, this is my time to just simply chill the fuck out. 
um, is super important, especially when it comes to like longevity, right? Uh, great points, man. Are there any um, things you have coming up in 2020 that you'd like people to stay on the lookout for? Uh, <coughs> I got a couple things. Some uh, some things I can't speak of yet. Um, oh, you know, he's gonna be things. dropping fire. Another reason to go uh, give him a follow on social media. Yeah, I got a couple things been working on for a couple of years that are starting to come to fruition. So it's nice. I just I like to keep quiet on a lot of things because I don't like the. I don't like the outside pressure of feeling that I need to produce anything. I like to produce things when I, when I choose to. Um, but that, you know, speaking at a couple events this year, I think the soonest one coming up is FitCon out in Utah. That's a pretty neat event. It's got some really cool guys like Chris Gethin goes out there. What's the uh, date I'll, for that? What's that? That's, that's, what's... I think that's May 1st to the mm. 2nd. Yeah, All so. of you tuning in who live in that area or planning to go to there, go check out Will's, uh, Will's um, what is it? It's a I'll, discussion I'll be, or a presentation? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll be speaking there. I'll be one of the speakers. Cool. Go check him out. And um, thanks again for coming on, man. I genuinely appreciate it. I'm sure a lot of people took tons of value away from this. And um, maybe in the near future, we could do it again. Hell yeah, man. I appreciate you for having me. Cheers, brother. Thanks again for watching, guys, and uh, stay tuned for future episodes.